year and then it's a quarter of a million dollars? Do we wait two more years after that? I mean, at what point are we really going to consider how meaningful distribution is? I think what is important to do for the university and for the regions is to look at the position, whether it be uh, Charles McCandless position or anybody else's position, whether it be a faculty or administrator, and say, do we need to accomplish that, that function for the university? If we need to accomplish that function, is there a more efficient way to do that? Um, now, I hear you saying, well, do we need that person? I would rather not personalize it in that sense. I think we well, need to, well, let me finish. I think that we need to look at the functions of the position. Because if those functions that are being carried on are not needed for the position, for the university, and for the health of this institution, then, then we should reconsider it. But I think it's very important as we start talking about, well, why don't we eliminate this person, or that person, or this faculty member, or that department? I think we have to decide is that leading toward the accomplishment of the strategic goals and the long-range planning that has gone on on this campus? And I, you know, I don't want to speak, speak specifically to that situation. I have not heard those rumors. I have not heard this presentation until today. Uh, but I think if I, given some time, I could probably have a response to that. I've had the privilege of visiting with all the presidential candidates, and I'm most confident that whoever is selected, uh, that he will uh, very carefully look at uh, his entire staff and his entire vice presidential structure because he has a responsibility of managing this institution under the guidance of the Board of Regents. And I'm very confident that uh, whoever is selected is going to look very carefully at the entire university structure as well he should. Yes. Yes. I have a question in regards to this uh, view uh, what is I believe it would have a devastating effect. I, I believe it will. You know, when we're looking at a situation where we're unable to fill faculty and, and administrative positions because of budget um, cuts, we're absolutely putting ourselves on hold in terms of improving our diversity. And, and I hope that this is a short-term type of situation and that the long-term goal of increasing that diversity is resumed when the, the funds are available. Um, you know, look, more and more we beco we're becoming dependent on funds other than the state appropriations. This institution is no longer primarily funded by state appropriations. We, we have a high dependence on student tuition and outside funding, whether it be federal or private funding. And that, and I agree with Bob on this, uh, really changes the um, sort of philosophical base for the university. And it's, it's rather frightening. And, and my opinion as one region is that the state needs to pay its share <coughs> of supporting our public universities if they are truly going to be public universities in the sense that they've been established in, in the past. No, my understanding of the university and college interest here, these would be priority searches. They would not go first, they would go last. You may have in mind the two searches that are associated with women's studies and African American studies. No, those would be priority searches to be preserved and brought to closure with appointments. Other positions, if I'm sure, I, I haven't asked David if I could say this, but I'm sure other positions would in fact be forfeit first. I mean, that's flat out institutional policy. Bill, you had a question. Well, it looks to me as if Iowa State is in a much more critical situation than the other two universities 
in this area, particularly the Irish banking. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with the pattern of attrition of bankers, free institutions. I get the impression it's much more serious here at Iowa State University. We have lost more banking members than have been replaced in the last four years. In fact, I think the other institutions may have added banking. And now it comes to the point where you're going to put the long range plan into effect and hire 50 more faculty people, and there isn't any money. And I think we're in a very critical situation, probably because of the priorities of the administration during the past four years, which has seen fit to allow this attrition for probably other, uh, other priorities. Well, the other institutions are also looking to add faculty to their. But have they lost faculty? Yes, they have. They have lost some faculty, yeah, and in this past this past year, the, I know the University of Iowa has been able to fill. I think I believe it was 15 positions. I believe that's right. And now they wanted to. This next year was another year to continue that toward that goal of increasing their faculty, and they are at the same point as Iowa State is now. I don't know if the if there's a critical difference in the two institutions or the three institutions. Um, I'd have to defer to, to the presidents of the institutions to get that information. I don't have the current <coughs> figures. Yes, question at the back. Money has always been an issue for the institutions. I mean, that is not a new issue. And whether it was a uh, whether it was an issue of the Farm Bureau having its offices in the same place as our Extension office, that is not a new issue. That is an old issue. We've always struggled with that. Whether Iowa State is involved this year in setting up a research park, or whether Iowa State was involved years ago in developing Maytag blue cheese, or whether it was involved in setting up all kinds of seed corn. Uh, varieties such that have benefited the state or developing animal vaccines which have increased the uh, animal production and the health of those animals in this in our society whether that was viewed as an economic activity or not I think to say that in 1991 or in 1985 the university started taking on and in particular Iowa State University started taking on economic activities is ignoring the past something that this institution cannot do and should not do. Dave? Okay, but I'd like to get as many people involved as I can. David, you had, and then we'll come over here. To but it, it strikes me that while there is some truth to what Bob said earlier, I'm not so sure that it's inconsistent with education in the democracy. I mean, it seems to me that there, there was a time, perhaps, when higher education was a, a very restricted opportunity for very few people, and at that time also, there was a very restricted amount of transmission out to the rest of society from those people in higher education. Perhaps they served as advisors to royalty, but as far as the benefit of the common man or woman in those countries, uh, it wasn't there. And so we, we can argue about should universities be working with corporate entities, but I think it's hard to not work with corporate entities but to also get the knowledge and the development out so that it benefits the society. And so I would submit that there's an equally strong argument for involvement with society, including the corporate part of society. Jimmy, I, I, oh, sorry, I'll go ahead. Two cents. Uh, I think part of the stuff about elitism is a red herring. But you also have to raise the question, who's benefiting from all of this, all right? Uh, the presumption on your part is that all of this stuff with corporations is benefiting 
the majority of people and, 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 and the helping democratize society, it seems to me that that's a, a, an extremely uh, arguable assumption as to who is benefiting from the involvement of universities with corporations. And it seems to me that it's not the majority of people. So, I mean, we could debate that for King. Jamil, yeah. um, your question. <laughs> I think I can answer that one in terms of uh, what Vice President Madden, uh, to what he was referring. First of all, I think Vice President Madden indicated that that was a possibility that fees could be increased. And the fees about which he was speaking, it's my understanding, is not the fees as faculty and, and staff and students traditionally think. It would be more on the lines of fees for service for which the university is providing. For instance, the Veterinary Diagnostics Laboratory, the CIRIS activities. Activities which we provide the public, perhaps in uh, not-for-credit courses. Activities which are out there which right now generate some income, but perhaps don't generate as much income as perhaps the market would bear. And I think that Mr. Madden was talking about the fact that these are possibilities for increases. Uh, obviously, the government, the student body, and the Graduate Student Senate did approve recently an increase in, an approval of increase in fees for computer use, but that was uh, that was not the role that I think Vice President Madden was speaking. And I also uh, should emphasize that each year, the regents have to approve increases in fees that, that students pay. And we have always been very careful about that. As much as students feel that we set tuition separately and then really raise those fees, from the time I've been on the board in the last four years, the, the numbers of Raises, uh, rises in fees have been very, very limited. Uh, one exception to that is the area of student health, where there has been a significant increase because we had a significant deficit in that area. But we have been very open about that. Anytime fees have been increased, it's been with a great deal of agony on the part of the regents because we realize what students have to go through, that an increase in any fee is just as significant if they have to pay it as an increase in tuition. Yes. One. The, the question is, can we uh, deal with the problem of relating efficiency and education? I gather there's some worry about efficiency can corrupt what's meant by education. Mary? <laughs> I guess I'm the one to answer Yes, that. right. I have, in my comments, talked about efficiency and effectiveness. Um, efficiency isn't efficiency if it eliminates a necessary function for an institution. And if we say that something can be done in a more efficient manner, then the proof is in the pudding. If the job gets done in a way that it needs to be done in order to support the surrounding um, uh, academic um, environment, then it's fine if it can, done be, can be done in a more efficient manner, we should do it. But if it means eliminating functions that are necessary to the environment and necessary to the carrying out of that plan that this institution has put together, uh, then it's not efficient. Well, to me, that's where the strategic planning process comes into play. And if, if the strategic plan is not a reflection of what this institution ought to be, then somebody's not participating in the way they should. Excuse me, I have to break in now. I have to give Jan Barron, who's been leading all of this, an opportunity to say thank you. Yes, I'd like to thank the panel, all of you, for being part of it and invite you back to continue the dialogue right here and hear the students' perspective on the university at 4 o'clock this afternoon. Pardon? Oh, Pioneer Room. Oh, Pioneer Room. Could I? Okay. Yeah. And tonight at the Sun Room with uh, Jim Hightower.
I'd like to set I'd like to set this proceeding though in some context okay. that uh, would permit you to carry from here to wherever else you go today some uh, rational way of understanding what happened here. It strikes me that however you see Bob Hollinger's assessment of the current state of affairs, or however you see Reed's sort of reality check what's going on in the real world and how do we deal with those circumstances, <laughs> and and the and Mary Williams and the perspective of the, of the Board of Regents, it's, it strikes me as very safe to say that if nothing else in the United States today, there's, a, there's certainly a very present, a, a spreading self-doubt about what the country is all about. I mean, this is the legacy of the Reagan-Bush era, frankly. We aren't sure of ourselves. The great worry, the great worry, and this I think is a legitimate worry associated with Hollinger's line of thought, is that we don't understand where the universities are going to come out in the context of this uncertainty. The classical liberal view is to see the university as the critic that takes a look at all of this stuff going on, offering some insight on how it's to be understood and how it's to be dealt with. The job of the regents is a terrible job in a setting that calls for, on the one hand, a kind of tradition-oriented policy of trying to preserve order. On the other hand, there are among the regents jester-like people who are also themselves critics and who doubt what's going on. It's, it strikes me that if there's any point in discussing the role of higher education in a democracy, it's clearly trying to come to some terms with or to come to grips with this basic issue. Is a university the kind of institution that can take the risks associated with being jester while also holding out its hand to receive from people who are unfriendly to the role of the jester the kind of largesse that keeps them going? That's a grave risk-taking role. And to expect, it, it strikes me, that the university be able to pull this off without any danger is really to fail to understand what it means to be the university. If anybody's existence in society should be precarious, it should be ours, but for the right reasons. Is there any reason this panel can't run overtime? time? We'll, have we'll, to we'll go as long as you want to go, but I wanted to get my two cents in before <laughs> anybody leaves, I've and now we'll go. I've got my answer. Reed's got to go. Um, I can stay for a few minutes, but I have another. And Bob, Bob is here too. Bob would like to stay. Well, they say we have time that we have to get out of here.